My name is Bismarck Beverly. I edit the General Telegraph newspaper. I happened to read the book Accounting for the People. There are a number of structures. You built a number of schools, university for the voter region, and then the BA, among others. One would say that what is the benefit of building those schools if your government, for that matter, you have embarked on anti-teacher policies to the extent of scrapping the allowances. Your closest contender, Nana Dodanko, had indicated to restore those allowances. How do you reconcile your structures by anti-teacher policy? Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I think I'm uh, My name is Yao Menu from PCFM. Mine has to do with the situation in Bronga Hafu region, which is the microfinance. Um, of course, a lot of figures are coming out. For instance, some say that over 50 people have lost their lives as a result of the situation over there. And your name and the name of your wife have been mentioned as persons behind the situation. Indeed, what um, the people are asking is, who will help us get our money? We don't care who is behind it. Who will help us get our money so that we have our life back? Thank you. My name is Charles Techibuadu. I write for the Daily Guide newspaper. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you and your government promised to end Doom so by 2015. And a lot of Ghanaians were expecting that by the end of the year, it would have ended. But Doom so still persists. How do you expect Ghanaians to hold you in trust to deliver on promise and vote for you come 2016? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Your Excellency. My name is Oprajan from Daily Democrat. There's this talk about transformational agenda. Is it an admission of a failure by your government? And what are the main policies behind the agenda? Thank you. We believe that it's necessary to expand access to education so that we can have more of our people benefit, you know, from tertiary education. And um, government is not able to do it alone. And so we started a policy of accrediting private, you know, uh, um, institutions to provide tertiary education. So we now have quite a lot of private um, institutions. But then at the same time, we believe that government also has a role in terms of uh, providing tertiary education. So in um, the government under Professor Arthur Mills, he came out with a policy that we will have a public university, one public university in every region. And so in fulfillment of that policy, we started the process of putting up the University of Energy and Renewable Resources in Bronga Hafu region, and started the process of putting up um, UHAS, the University of Health and Allied Sciences in the Volta region. And then also we're continuing with the uh, university in the Easting region, which will be a university de dedicated to environmental uh, studies and agriculture. And so, yes, we are expanding uh, uh, space in public universities in order that we can train more professionals. But coming down to your, um, uh, your question about teacher trainees, let's, let's take the politics away. Um, I know that political contest is keen, and so everybody wants to take advantage to be able to uh, overcome their political opponents. Otherwise, this is purely, purely political talk. We had teacher training institutions that could not fill their spaces because they were under a quota system. And so we had, in all the teacher training institutions, we had only 9,000 students who were under training. And we paid them allowances to train. It was an incentive for them to train. Now there are two issues here. Teacher training takes place in the colleges of education and also takes place in University of Education, Winneba, and University of Cape Coast. At the time, the colleges of the education were not tertiary degree awarding institutions. There was no problem because we're training professional teachers and if we paid them an allowance, there was not a problem. But then we raised them to tertiary institutions and brought them to the same level as University of Education Winneba and University of Cape Coast, also training teachers. And so in these ones, we don't pay teacher trainee allowances. We say go for students' loan. But then in these ones that are also tertiary institutions 
and degree awarding, we say you will pay you teacher training allowance. First, there's no sense of equity in that. So that was the first problem. Sometime in President Kufour's administration, I was informed that principals of colleges of education went to President Kufour and said that, look, the quota system leaves space in their schools. So they want permission to bring in fee-paying teacher trainees to come and train, full fee-paying teacher trainees to come and train. And President Kufour did a good thing. He refused. He said, no, we cannot have that inequity. And if we need more uh, teachers, we should do something about it, rather than say they should come in and be fee-paying. And so once we raised them to tertiary status and made them degree and diploma awarding, we said, look, let's create equity between them and the other universities, because we've created even the Student Loans Trust. And so you can go to the Student Loans Trust and take a loan to finance your education, and then you pay it over years when you have completed. Now, that will allow us to increase enrollment. So with the banning of the quota and the removal of the training allowances, enrollment into teacher training institutions has increased by 63%. So it means that that extra 63% of students who today can go and train and be teachers and come out and get employment and work would not have had space in these teacher training institutions if we had continued to pay the teacher training allowances. That is a simple issue. But, I mean, in our political discourse and the competition for power, they say, when I come back, we'll restore it. I mean, to what purpose? They have, they have the student loan. And the trainees have started accessing the student loan. From the records I have, more than 5,000 of them have uh, gone to access the, the, the student loan uh, allowance, uh, the, the student loan, and are financing their education using the student loan, which they will pay after they have gotten employment for government over an extended period of time. And so I don't think it's necessary for us to continue to inject you know, politics into policy making. Policy making must be consistent so that we are able to make it more predictable and more useful to our country. So that's what I'll say. But to say that we are anti teacher, you know, it's, I mean, if you look at a lot of the things that we have done, I think it's just political propaganda to say we're anti teacher. I have a document here which I got from the Ministry of Education, and it just shows the things that has been done in respect, in, in respect to teachers. Even the teacher training uh, colleges of education, we have increased the feeding grants to the colleges of education, and we feed the students in the colleges of education three times a day. We don't do that in University of Education, Winneba. We don't do that in University of Cape Coast. So even with the, getting the loan, they're able to use it on other things because government is feeding them, you know, uh, with a feeding grant. And so that, that is happening. We took a $156 million World Bank uh, support for improving secondary education. And under that program, 60,000 math, science, and ICT teachers are undergoing capacity uh, building. We have expanded distance education so that more people who were formerly pupil teachers can upgrade their skills and become professional teachers and be able to be absorbed into the teaching profession. We have introduced the TTEL, they call it Transforming Teacher Education and Learning, which is a 90 billion Ghana CDs capacity and pedagogy improvement program for colleges of education. And that has commenced for the first time. We're building community day schools and providing offices and accommodation for, for teachers I don't think that a government that is anti-teacher, you know, will, will do that. And it is a, an unkind cut to say that when we have one of the most respected educationists as the Minister of Education. I don't think Professor Nana Jane would put in any policies that are inimical to teachers. She, indeed, I cited a letter that was written by the Ghana National Association of Teachers, you know, expressing appreciation to our Minister of Education for her openness and her close relation, uh, working relation with the Ghana National Association of Teachers. You know, so how can that translate into anti-teacher? I, I think that is just propaganda somebody is trying to, to put out. She's been concerned about teacher absenteeism and she's been crusading on teacher absenteeism. And I'm happy to announce that teacher absenteeism in 2012 was 
Today, in 2015, it has dropped to 9.3 percent. And all the union leaders, Nat, Nagrat, uh, Utak, Potag, you know, have all been working very closely with this minister. And so I think that it's absolutely untrue to make that kind of statement. Now to talk about microfinance and the issue particularly affecting the Bronga Hafu region. The Bank of Ghana has responsibility for registering microfinance institutions. And as you are aware, we've passed an act of the Bank of Ghana that makes it independent and autonomous in terms of conducting its work. And so government is not allowed to interfere in the work of the Bank of Ghana. And so it's their sole preserve. But when a situation develops that affects the people, of course, Ghana government cannot sit aloof and you know say that because the Bank of Ghana is responsible, then we have nothing to do with it. And so for the past several weeks, government and the Bank of Ghana have been working in tandem to resolve the issues uh, that have arisen in the Bronga Hafu region. Now, what, what has happened? Several companies were issued with provisional certificates. The procedure in Bank of Ghana is when you go to apply for a microfinance license, you are giving a provisional certificate. And then you are giving six months within which to bring all the documentation and everything that you need to be able to uh, uh, qualify for a permanent license as a microfinance institution. And you're given the guidelines in which you have to operate. Unfortunately, many of these microfinance companies, one, have failed to validate their uh, uh, documentation, which will give them permanent licenses. And then two, they have not operated within the guidelines that they were given by the Bank of Ghana. And I believe that in this sense, the Bank of Ghana needs to improve its banking supervision or it's uh, whichever supervision department looks after this microfinance sector because there's been an absolute explosion in the numbers of these uh, uh, institutions. Now, from my understanding, they are not supposed to receive, take deposits. They're supposed to give, you know, credits and they make an interest on the credits that they give and that's how they expand their capital. So microfinance institutions are different from savings and loans companies. But most of these microfinance companies have started taking deposits from people. So that's one category. Then there's another category that are not licensed at all. And they open offices and start taking deposits from people and promising them, you know, abnormal interest rates. And so these are the two categories of companies that we are we're dealing with. With that second category, they call themselves social clubs. And so when Bank of Ghana has gone on them, they say, no, no, it's a voluntary organization. It's like a glorified susu. We have agreed. So what they do is they give you an agreement form that you are joining you know, a voluntary association and you make monthly contributions of so much based on which you get this profit. And so when you go on them, they say, no, we're a voluntary association. We don't need to be licensed. I mean, if we come together and decide that we want to contribute our money uh, to each other and share the profit and interest, what is the uh, business of government? So that is what they've used to avoid, you know, uh, abiding by the regulations. But DKM was licensed by Bank of Ghana as a microfinance institution. It breached the territory because you normally have a territory that is defined for you. It breached the territory it was supposed to work in. And aside from that, it breached a lot of the regulations regarding interest and other things. And the thing is, in this country, we should remember that there was PIRAM. We should remember that there was R5, in which a lot of people lost their money. If anybody comes promising you that I'll give you 55% profit on your money, I mean, just know that he's, he's fooling you and it will collapse. Because all you do is take somebody's money and add it and give to this person and then take another person's money, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. And at the same time, they extract, you know, part of the money and build properties and do things that are not in the names of the company, but in the names of their, 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 uh, uh, themselves and their relations and other people. And so these are things that we need to look out for. I saw the DKM for the first time in the newspapers today. I don't know who he is from Adam. 
And yet, my wife doesn't know him from Adam. And yet, it was said that it was our institution and he was representing us. It's the first time I saw him, a lanky, tall chap. You know? So, like I said, government is getting involved. They were called, they were invited, they were interrogated, and they themselves admitted that they didn't have the money. Indeed, DKM had a balance of only about 10 million in his account. And if you look at how much he owes, he owes hundreds of millions of Ghana cities. God is love had 61 million in the account, or 65 million, and they had collected in excess of 300 million CDs. And the fear why Bank of Ghana acted was that if Bank of Ghana did not freeze the money that was left in the account, they were going to withdraw it and run away. And so Bank of Ghana was acting to protect the interests of the people. Then these people turn around and go and say, Bank of Ghana has, take, we are not paying you because Bank of Ghana has taken the money, and that they are using it to do roads in the country. 61 million CDs to do roads. The Cocoa Roads program alone is 3 billion CDs. What are we going to take, uh, uh, what is it, God is, God is laughs, 61, 65 million to do roads. And yet that is why they, they've gone around telling people. And I expect that all of us as political leaders will be responsible. And that our intention, first and foremost, is to protect the interests of the innocent Ghanaians who have been affected by this. And yet again, for political expediency, political opponents take it and go around from place to place. They say they are doing forum and inciting the people against government. I think we must stop this deviousness in our politics. Absolutely. So there's going to be a forum there on Wednesday. The opinion leaders and everybody are going to be brought. They're going to be apprised of the true situation of what has happened. And the money that is left in the goddess love or whatever, eh, they would have to have Bank of Ghana monitor and get the people to bring, those who contributed to bring it. They might not get the super profits they were expecting, but at least if everybody gets a part of the money that is available, then it should be distributed to them. But in the meantime, we'll go after their properties. We must seize the trucks and uh, uh, vehicles and other things that they bought with the money. If you take the example of DKM, you see all these buses going DKM, DKM, you think, you go and look at the registration of the buses, and it's in individuals' names. It's not even in the name of the company. And that was done intentionally so that no, they knew that there would be a problem. And if there's a problem, you can't come after the vehicle because it's not registered in the name of the company. But government is going to take action to protect the interests of Ghanaians. But I appeal to my fellow Ghanaians, if somebody is offering you higher than the treasury bill rate, profits free, please take a step back and look at it. When I saw the category of even some of those who have lost money and been duped in this scheme, I was shocked. Intellectuals, professionals, Yeah. I'll expect that my uncle or somebody, illiterate uncle or somebody in the village, is the one who will fall prey to something like this. But intellectuals, heads of religious institutions, have taken collection and gone and put in. <laughs> you know, so let's not play politics. Let's not play politics with this. Bank of Ghana will do its best to distribute whatever is available in conjunction with the, 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 the companies. And I've asked the BNI to look for and identify all their properties. And let's put a lien on those properties so that even if we sell those properties and we get some money, we can still refund money to the people who lost it. But then we're going to prosecute them for fraud. And so they currently in BNI custody, they've been remanded for a week. We'll go back to court, and we'll, the investigation has started. And those who have cheated the people will, will pay for what they have done. <laughs> Dumso, as it's called in Ghana, <laughs> but uh, 
the actual name is load management. When demand exceeds supply, you have a gap, and so you need to manage the load so that you don't break down the system. And um, it's an issue that we have faced perennially. Um, in 1983, we had a very serious uh, issue with load, and um, that's because our main source of supply, which was the Akosombo Dam, was affected by low rainfall, and so it was operating almost like it is today at a minimal level. So a good part of the dam had to be shut down. And so the amount of power that was available to distribute was uh, small, and so we had to go through load management. And then I remember again, uh, when I was in government about the 90s, we had another spell of um, uh, load shedding. And um, again, um, in uh, between 2000 and 2005, thereabouts, we also had a, a major problem with load management. Now what it means is that we need to plan our, our uh, demand, forecast our demand, and plan generation to keep, keep up with, with demand. And so when I spoke last year, almost a year ago, I said that we have had this problem before, but what we have always done is to try and patch the problem, and then it resurfaces. And so what I intend to do is to fix the problem, and that is exactly what I've been working on. One of the major sectors that takes a lot of my time and attention is the power sector as president. And I must say that we have made a great effort. We are as close as we are to solving the problem of, of doing so. And I'm sure that for most people, from the Christmas time, you can see a very visible improvement in terms of supply. Now, a lot of the time when there's an outage, when, when your lights go off, it's normally because of an outage or something like that. We still have a gap. We haven't closed the gap. But I believe that in the next uh, touch wood, let me not predict. <laughs> In the next short while, <laughs> we will be able to, we'll be able to overcome, we'll be able to overcome uh, the problem of load shedding. I've learned to leave it to the technical people to talk about, and they are having, they are having a major press briefing tomorrow. They are going to brief the press on the routine maintenance a travel plant is going to go through. Um, it is a scheduled maintenance, and so it means gas is going to stop flowing. So they have to retune the plants there to crude oil. And um, normally when the plants use crude oil, they are not as efficient, and so there can be any difficulty that arises. And so we just want Ghanaians to understand that this is what is going to happen. And I'm sure when they do that address, they will also tell you where we are currently in respect of resolving the power crisis uh, permanently. We now, as a result of the work that we did, have sufficient generation. The major pro uh, problem now would be to provide the fuel. And so we need to resolve the issues to do with the West African gas pipeline. There are technical issues there. Even when it's operated normally, it operates in a very unpredictable manner. And so as I speak, um, the chief executive of GMPC and um, a company called Quantum are in Qatar to discuss the issue of a floating storage regasification unit. It's called FSRU. And what that does is it's a floating barge, and then you bring liquid uh, natural gas, and you pump it into the barge, and it regasifies it and supplies it just like any gas pipeline to the thermal plants. We need to have that as insurance so that if anything happens to the West African gas pipeline, or anything happens to our own Etriabo plant. If we had an FSRU in Etriabo today, with the shutdown of the gas plant, we won't have to shut down any plants or convert them to crude. We'll just use the FSRU and provide gas to the uh, thermal plants to continue to work as they have done normally. And so we are fortifying the, uh, uh, um, the power sector, both in terms of generation and in terms of the distribution network, we've also invested a lot of money in Gridco to expand the distribution network and make it more robust so that it's able to transmit the electricity. But the most important 
sector, which is our Achilles heel, is the distribution, downstream distribution sector. We're bringing in more generation. We're even inviting private companies to come and generate. And so we have independent power producers coming in. Now independent power producers, before they even sign the agreement, they ask you to put down an LC. And so the moment you don't pay them, they draw down on the LC. And then you have to make up the LC back to the amount. It's a standby letter of credit. So that anytime you don't pay them, they just take their money from the bank. And then you have to top up the LC back to what it was. That's what a standby letter of credit is. So it means that we must be collecting enough money at the distribution level to be able to pay the power producers. When the power producer was a good old VRA, if we didn't pay, Leo Crown won't come and you know, switch off our lives because we haven't paid. But when an IPP sets up his plant and you don't pay, he will take it from the, from the LC. And when he takes it from the LC, you are committed to uh, uh, top up the LC. And so it means that we must improve efficiency at the downstream level. That is at the ECG level. And I have gone to many friends' house and I sit and I see their electricity bill on the table and I take it. And he owes 1,000 Ghana CDs. I said, hey, you alone 1,000 Ghana CDs. Somebody 800, somebody 500. I said, ah, if you alone owe 1,000 and you calculate the number of ECG subscribers like you who are not paying on time, then what amount do we owe ECG? A lot of money. And so one, we must improve collection so that when people pay, uh, people um, uh, owe, they pay promptly or they are disconnected. Because when we don't pay, then we make it more expensive for everybody else. And the worst crime is those who steal power. It's estimated that we lose more than 25% of power. The power loss due to transmission, you know, should be below 15%. And so if you are losing 25 to 27% because people are not paying or people are stealing the power, then it means that you cannot collect enough money to pay the upstream uh, generation uh, companies. And that is why we need to restructure uh, Electricity Company of Ghana. And under the MCC Compact, it is targeted at restructuring ECG. And let me state emphatically that ECG is not being privatized. ECG is going to continue to be a public-owned company. It will be the owner of the equipment and logistics. The transformers and things are going to belong to ECG. But then we're putting in a system that allows the private sector to contribute to collection of revenue and responding to customers' complaints and so on and so forth. And the point is, it would end up employing more people than ECG can employ. So ECG will continue to exist. We're going to inject more than $100 million into ECG. And at the same time, we're going to get private sector participation as a concession in terms of revenue collection and response to customer complaints so that we make it more efficient, so that it's generating enough revenue to be able to pay the uh, generators of power. But one of the most you know, recalcitrant culprits for non-payment are government institutions. Government institutions have come to the belief that because they are government, you can't cut them off. And so we won't pay. Meanwhile, in the goods and services and the budgets that are approved for government institutions, electricity and utility uh, bills are, are, are provided for. But then once the money comes, paying those utilities is not the most attractive thing. It's a workshop at Wudu Dua that is the priority. That one, TNT go flow. So instead of going to pay the bill, we would rather go and do our workshops and things. Then you come back to the office, and ECG come and cut uh, your power. And then you say, oh, how can ECG cut our power? And so when ECG started, I said, look, the first place, go to Ministry of Power. If they haven't paid, cut them. <laughs> and so ECG went and was going to cut the Ministry of Power. They had to find money and pay. And so if they do that to their own ministry, then what would they do to other agencies? And so we need to repackage all these things so that we can have sustainable power. If we don't, it will be like the ostrich hiding its head in the sand. You take your head out and the danger is still there.
we can end up with doom so again. And so we have made a plan from now till 2020 to ensure that we put in an extra 3,000 megawatts. With what we are putting in currently, we are putting in about a 1,000 megawatts fast track emergency. Because if you calculate uh, KTPP, you calculate uh, Asogli phase two, you calculate the car power ship, which currently is producing 220 megawatts, and then you put a Mary in, then we're talking of about a 1,000 uh, megawatts that is available currently. If we can ensure that we have enough fuel, well, we're doing the collections properly to be able to, to run them. The final one is about transformational agenda. The constitution says that in, before the end of your second year in office as president, you must um, present to parliament a medium term uh, vision. And so at the end of last year, the NDPC had done a lot of work and we presented a document to parliament called the Agenda for Transformation. Now the basis of that is that we looked at the structure of the Ghanaian economy and realized that it was largely import dependent and therefore it put a lot of pressure on the economy and it put a lot of pressure on the city and so we kept seeing you know continuous depreciation in the value of the city and that is because we had stuck to traditional exports uh, revenues that is gold, you know, cocoa, and all those kinds of things. And yet we could diversify both in terms of exporting and also in terms of reducing our import dependence. And so that is what the Agenda for Transformation is about, is to diversify the quality of our exports by ensuring that we're adding in manufacturing and industry, and then at the same time, expanding the production of things for which we have a comparative advantage to produce, but currently are importing in large quantities. And so there are several projects lined up under the Agenda for Transformation, which we currently are pursuing. We have provided financing to rice farmers in Ghana. At the time I came to office, we were producing 30% of the rice that we consume in Ghana. Today we're produ producing 60% of the rice consumed in Ghana. And because there's a distinctive difference in price, between locally produced rice and imported rice of almost 500 CDs. A bag of locally produced rice is about 100 Ghana CDs. A bag of imported rice is 1.5, 150 uh, Ghana CDs. And so there is a good demand for uh, locally produced rice. On the 7th January, I spent the day in uh, Asuchari with the rice farmers there. And you should just go and see what they're doing. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, the land under irrigation is still small. Each of them has an average of 0.7 of a hectare. And so they are cropping twice a year, but if they had a bigger piece of land, they will be able to crop more and improve the quality of their lives. And so we had aimed to bring another 10,000 hectares under irrigation, under the CDB project. But you know what happened with the China Development Bank uh, project. There are some of the projects that have stalled. And so what I've done is to refer that project to the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund and get the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund to raise the financing to bring another 10,000 hectares under cultivation. And if we did that and we expanded the size of the farmer's lands, every farmer will get an average of five hectares and they're producing five tons of rice per hectare. And if they're producing twice a year, you can imagine the amount of rice that they will produce for this country. There's another project that SADA is working on with the Brazilians in the north. That is the Nasia Nabogo project. That also is aiming to bring 10,000 hectares of land under irrigation using water from the White Volta. And that will produce maize, it will produce rice, it will produce soya bean. Aside from that, we're working on a shrimp. We want, it's, it's new, we're bringing shrimp culture into Ghana. Vietnam alone makes $1.5 billion a year from exporting shrimp. America. And it's something that we can also do here. Indeed, it, uh, uh, the survey that was done showed that we have even, you know, a better environmental conditions for shrimp production. And so we're looking at a 500 acre shrimp farm to start. We've got an off taker from Spain who has offered to buy every single uh, shrimp that is produced. And so if you have the off taker, you know, you have the farm, then what is your problem? And so the Ministry of Aquaculture is, is working on that. We're looking at a new initiative in, in palm oil. You can't believe that we import palm oil 
into this country. And yet we have acres and acres of land suitable for palm plantations that are lying, you know, uncultivated. And so in the Sona, I'm going to announce a new uh, initiative uh, to expand palm production so that we are able to, at least if we can even produce to feed ourselves and not import palm oil, I think it will be a good thing. We are reintroducing coffee production. I've asked the Cocoa Board to take it up. They are working with Touton, a French company, and this year they're going to nest two million coffee seedlings. And they're going to train, you know, young farmers how to grow coffee and be able to, you know, uh, make an income out of it. The coffee will be bought, you know, by the French company. It will be processed and create a brand of Ghana coffee. There's Colombian coffee, there's Ethiopian coffee. We, why don't we have Ghana coffee? And so these are initiatives under the Agenda for Transformation that we are working on. And I know that they will create hundreds and thousands of jobs for our, our people. There are several other initiatives, but I cannot take all the time you know, to answer them. Thank you.